All right. Welcome, everyone, to the second episode of the Water Relief Podcast. I'm your host, Noah Berger. We're back again. We're back again with another pitcher from the Marlins bullpen. Stephen Okert is here with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. All right. So we're just going to go through your career and I have a couple of questions, maybe a couple of stories that I want to pull out of you. Um, so you were drafted back in 2010 and okay. 2011 oh. by the Brewers and yes. you didn't sign with them. What went on there? What goes on in that kind of situation? Like take us into that as a player being drafted at that age and um, making the decision not to sign. Yeah, honestly, I had no idea I would even be drafted and uh, got a call from the Brewer scout and they did kind of a summer follow-up thing. I played summer ball that year. They wanted to see me play and then ended up with no offer. So it wasn't really my decision on that one. So it was kind of, they just told me they weren't going to offer and to go back to school. Ah, so it's actually the team's decision in that case. That one was, yes. So then in 2012, you were drafted in the fourth round by the Giants. Yes. How was that? Uh, that was awesome. We had just got back from uh, regionals in Virginia, and we got back late, and I get a call in the morning. And, and I mean, I didn't even – I just they called and said congratulations, and I was just waking up. I'm like, for what? And then I didn't even have the scouts number saved. And, you know, then he obviously told me I was drafted in the fourth round by the Giants. And, you know, then I started getting texts from family and everybody congratulating me and stuff. It was awesome. That's, that's really cool. Um, so going through the Giants organization, you made it all the way up to the major leagues. You made your debut in 2016. Uh, I think it was against the Cardinals? The Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks. I had that in my notes. It's right here, and I completely didn't even look at it. Um, and it was a two innings pitched. Had, had had that field to just get on a major league mound. Oh, it was incredible. You know, I'd, I'd gotten to throw a couple times in um, in the Bay Series game, so I got the pitch there, but obviously not in the regular season. So you know, getting up there, the you know the place was packed. The, we were on the run of however many consecutive home game sellouts. So. It was incredible. And then, you know, I get out there and I walk the first guy and the, not such a good feeling then. <laughs> so, but, you know, next guy hits a, crushes a ground ball and Crawford and Panic turn two. And then I get my first strikeout for the next guy. That's awesome. So after multiple seasons with the Giants up until I think it was 2016, 20, 2019, you were granted free agency. And took two years off of baseball, it seems. Like, I can't find any stats for you. What what went on during that time? Yeah, that wasn't by choice. Well, you know, got free agency and thought, uh, you know, I thought I'd have a few, few teams trying to get me. And then throughout the offseason, just no communication from anybody. No, no teams were interested. Finally got some scouts to come out in January and watched a couple of bullpens and really still nothing. And then when through at the Padres spring training facility, like three times, I think through really, really well and still nothing. So, you know, and then COVID obviously hit and then nobody played, but it was, uh, it was not a good feeling to not have a job, have, you know, all 30 teams have reached out to all 30 teams and nobody wanted, you, you know, it was, it was pretty tough. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound fun at all. Um, so through the grapevine, I have found out that your, your agent is former Marlin Tom Kohler. Mm -hmm. How did that relationship come about? Um, like I said, you know, we weren't getting any interest from anyone. And, you know, so me and my wife talked and she ended up putting up a... Uh, anonymous post on Facebook through the wife's page trying to get uh, recommendations for agents and Tom's wife uh, commented and gave his information and I reached out to four or five different agencies and ended up going with Tom. I, 
you know, the way he, he was kind of persistent, asking me if we were ready to do this. He's ready to get to work. And, you know, obviously he he made good money in his career playing baseball. So to me, it felt like something that he really wanted to do. And it wasn't just, you know, him trying to be an agent to make some money. And so I go with him and I mean, he's nonstop reaching out to all the teams. He told me, he's like, dude, they're going to block me. I'm reaching out so much. And, uh, you know, for me, it was just like, well, you know, he's doing everything he can. So now it's all up to, to me to try to get a job. I and mean, he's reaching out. He's getting scouts here. He's, you know, getting some attention. And so I just I felt like he was a good pick, good match for me. So over the years, how much uh, how much interaction with him have you had, like since coming into the major leagues? Like how often do you see him? Um, I've seen him. Twice, I think. In person, obviously, last year through COVID, we weren't really allowed to do anything, and uh, this year it's much more open. But um, he texts me almost out of every, after every outing. You know, him and, and the owner of the agency, they both text me almost uh, every outing. But in person, I've seen Dave that he owns the agency, co owns it. I've seen him once. I had dinner with him in New York, and then I had um, dinner with Tom in spring training and. And lunch one year last year, one time last year with him. All right. So now that we've gone through the history of Stephen Okert, I want to ask you, was there any pitching coach or manager that you really, over the years, really connected with that you still go back to and get in contact with and talk to? Yeah, I still talk to uh, Steve Klein. You know, he played for quite a while. He was, uh, I had him as my pitching coach in low A, double A, and triple A. So I had him for years. And me and him, you know, since low A in 2013, we've kind of been boys. So I still call him every once in a while. And it's funny because some of the, you know, Ben and uh, Rick, our trainers, were with the Giants. So I call him and we'll talk to him and stuff. But he's him. And, and then there's one more. He, uh, Mike Couchet, he was our uh, short season coach for the Giants. And I really connected with him. So I'll still talk to those two. It seems like you, you, you have a lot of connections with that Giants organization because they brought you up. Um, did, was there any other player that you've connected with over the years from another team that you always have kept in touch with? Um, I still talk to Chris Stratton. And he's with the Pirates. I still talk to him uh, here and there. And then uh, Derek Law. I want to say I could be wrong. I feel bad, but I could say he's with the Twins. I can't remember who he said, but uh, I still talk to them. They were uh, I came up from low way all the way up with those two. So we and then Tyler Rogers. He uh, I was with him for years too. He's he's right behind me for all time appearance uh, leader for Sacramento, I believe. So <laughs> we were obviously together for quite some time. Wow, that's a lot. Um, all right, so. You've told me on in previous uh, meetings that you are a gamer. Yeah. What kind of games do you play? I've been playing a lot of Rock League lately. Um, been trying Apex, but I'm kind of terrible at it. I just can't get it. And then uh, Sea of Thieves. It's like this pirate game. Yeah. I've been playing that with one of my buddies. So how, how much gaming do you usually do when you're during the season? Uh, after games, go go back play for a couple hours before bed. Um, so we had Anthony Bass on last week, um, two weeks ago, um, and he was very um, particular about the first pitch strike mentality, and his that was one of his keys to success. What's one of your keys to success when it comes to when you're getting on the mound in in a tight situation? Um, you know, I'd have to kind of agree with him, uh, like looking at the outings I've had and, and the outings our bullpen's had as a whole, you know, everyone we get in there doesn't, I mean, obviously first pitch strikes great, but you know, first pitch ball, you got to get right back in there and get ahead. And, uh, you know, our numbers are just, when we're ahead, it goes our, in our favor way more. So, you know, that's something I've talked to Bass about you know, what he's done different from last year to this year. And, and that's one of the things that, you know, he keeps talking about is, 
really trying to get that first pitch strike, really getting ahead of guys and then, you know, staying aggressive and putting away early and not, you know, not messing around, getting deep earlier in the year, you know, I was going three, two to everybody and, you know, stressful every, every at bat was stressful. So definitely getting ahead is huge. Yeah. Getting ahead has to, it's hard, but it's important in, in your line of work. What's it like pitching on three straight days? Stuff. Um, <laughs> obviously, we you know we try to prepare for that. We have the idea that that's going to happen. Uh, felt honestly talking to to Bass and Tanner, we all felt pretty good. So you know that's a good thing. But, but for me, I feel like the toughest thing was you know facing the same couple hitters three days in a row. You know them getting to see me. Obviously, I'm gonna throw a lot of sliders. I get to see that a lot, and then I throw Bell a terrible one, and and he gets it. You know, I feel like that's that's the toughest part. It's just those guys getting to see us that many times. That's that in that many days. You know, when a when a wacky play happens or in an error or someone boots a ball, how do you get focused after that? How do you not let that just completely take you off the rails of of your pitch of your outing um i mean obviously you hope that'll happen but you know errors are gonna be part of the game and i mean how many times you look at wendell the other day with the the out he got for me for Cruz. i mean that ball is smoked that ball shouldn't be caught you know and he catches it so it's like obviously they're picking us up a lot on great plays you know everyone the whole our infield our outfield's been picking us up so it's like an air is going to happen i hope it doesn't you you know, take a second and get back up there and try to get a ground ball, turn two, try to, you know, get a quick out, get us back in the dugout. But really, you just try not to let it even affect you, you know. Um, so you're out in the bullpen for hopefully seven innings uh, before before you go out there. When do you usually start to get ready? Um, I'd say like mid-fifth, I'll start really rolling out and stretching and then uh, sixth inning of play catch with the outfielder and then through the sixth and seventh, just kind of move it around a little bit, trying to stay loose and tell the phone rings. So you say till the phone rings a couple, uh, I think a week or two ago, the Rockies were in town and I think Bass was past pitch the seventh and Nobody was on the mound of the bullpen during the bottom of the seventh. And the end of the seventh happens and you come out and you're like, what, wait, what me, what happened there? Well, there's not much to say about that. It was just a little miscommunication. So, you know, it was a little confusing, but, you know, like I said, luckily I, you know, stay ready from the fifth on. So, wasn't too bad. You know, I get some plyo balls in and stay pretty loose. So just a little mis- miscommunication. What kind of stuff are you guys talking about out there? What kind of stuff are you guys doing to pass the time? Oh, gosh. The first <laughs> few innings, it's honestly just random stuff. I got Tanner <laughs> sitting next to me, and he just got thoughts popping out everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Ted and he is here, same thing. Thoughts are just going everywhere. But we were joking yesterday uh, that, on you know, usually it's like the first three innings and then guys kind of start locking it in a little bit. We're joking on Sandy days that the whole bullpen's just checked out. You know, we don't got to do anything. It's, it's Sandy day, so we can just all hang out and mess around. You guys uh, ever take naps out there? No, definitely not that. Oh, God, we'd be all over social media for that. <laughs> that wouldn't be a good thing. How much, how much do you enjoy interacting with the fans that are in and around that are like around the bullpen? I know here there's the sports lounge right next to the bullpen and places like Philly, you've got them right behind you. What's that like? Philly. Philly's tough. You know, they're, they're out there just wearing you out the whole time. Uh, here, you know, we don't, the sports lounge is, they got that music so loud. So those people are in their own world. They're, they don't look, really talk to us or anything. Uh, most it's, just the kids above us just screaming ball at us. You know, we'll give them a wave, tell them hi, and they'll just continue to scream ball. So that's most interaction we get out there. 
every major league ballpark is different. Some bullpens are way out in center field. Some are, but are separated. Some are together. Some are down the lines in Tampa. What's yeah. your ideal setup for a bullpen? Oh man. Well, just anywhere not on the field. <laughs> <laughs> Fair like enough. Um, I think. I think Colorado's got a cool bullpen, but by the time you run in, you're tired. You know, it's so far away. Um, Isn't that the one with the like the rock with like the forest out yeah, there? Yeah, uh, it's got the little water, the little pond and stuff out there. It's a pretty cool one. Um, I like Atlanta's because it's got a quiet room. You get a little bullpen room, and it's I don't know what kind of glass. It's like bulletproof glass. It's silent in there. I mean, it's fan proof it. glass. You open the door, and it is just. So loud, screaming! You walk in there, it's you can get away, get a little quiet time. Sometimes but, I wish I had a room like that. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, just anything not on the field. Um. So to finish up, well, uh, you've got to throw teammates under the bus. Oh gosh. What kind of practical jokes have you witnessed over the last few weeks, whether out in the bullpen or in the clubhouse? There hasn't really been too many, honestly. I mean, nobody's – everyone just kind of hangs out. Nobody's really been, like, joking with anybody or doing anything. On the bus, the... obviously, you get called up and you got to sing or whatever. But Have you ever had to sing for the team? Not here. In, in 2016, I did. I had to sing uh, for Friends in Low Places, whatever that song's called. <laughs> it was great because wow. I knew the song, so 20 seconds in, the whole bus was singing, so that helped me, but the mic slowly went away. <laughs> um, all right. So, who's my final question before I ask for your final thoughts? Um, what who's the guy in the bullpen that likes to cause trouble stir the pot i'm just gonna have to say tanner i'll just throw tanner under there he's not gonna like it so next can he'll throw me back under but i'll say tanner <laughs> yeah i remember you guys a lot of things out you know like <laughs> hey see that see that yeah. so i was gonna say tanner yeah, you guys yesterday were having some fun in the clubhouse with the interviews they were doing and i'm, I'm oh, yeah. i can't wait yeah, for valley sure? to put up Oh, gosh. Yeah, I told him that he called me a snake and he wasn't having that. And <laughs> I told him he couldn't remember because he had said too many things since then. Yeah. All right. Do you have any final thoughts, any message for the fans or anybody out there? Uh, I mean, just thank all the fans. Keep coming out here. Keep back in the place. You know, we're having a great time. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen Oker. This has been the Water Leaf podcast on the Fish Drives podcast channel. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Thank you, guys.